Today, I'm going to talk a little bit with you about the latest scientific innovative approaches to helping us feel young. Now, when we're talking about feeling young, it really starts with cellular energy and cellular purification. So let's talk a little bit about that science today and about the age lock approach as well. Now, first of all, who's interested in aging? I know you are, but are there other people that are interested in aging and feeling young? Sure there are. In fact, in Europe, in, by 2050, the population of people over 65 will double. Well, there are a lot of people that are on their way to 65, so you don't have to turn 65 before you're interested in feeling younger, right? So let's talk a little bit about the new skin approach to anti-aging science. Now, in general, in science, the scientists are interested in aging, but they look at it from a descriptive biology approach. And really what that means is that they're studying all the things about aging, but not really with the view of trying to change things or help you feel better about it. So, for example, they're describing aging. They're really telling you things that you already know. I don't remember things as well as I did before. I don't have the energy that I had before. And even that my skin doesn't look as nice as it was before. At New Skin, our approach, the age lock approach, is simply targeting the sources of aging. That means we go right to the source rather than looking at the outside, the signs and symptoms. So if you look at this target that I've got here, you see that the sources of aging are at the inside. To understand aging and how we can change it and help you feel younger, we need to go to the sources of aging, not just describe what's happening in the signs and symptoms level. So let's look at it from this point of view. You're an organism, and in order to feel youthful, then you need to actually have cells that are producing the right stuff. The cells need to be healthy, they need to be producing energy, they need to be able to cleanse themselves, otherwise they're not going to stay young. So the cells then are responsible for ultimately how you feel your youthful feelings. If you go even further towards or upstream to the sources of aging, it is all about gene expression. It's the genes that program the cells, so gene expression is actually directing the cell's behavior, whether or not they're behaving youthfully or in an aged fashion. Let's look at it another way, just to make sure that you understand correctly. DNA, which is the code for your life, is fixed for life. The DNA does not change. So we're not talking here about uh, gene splicing or any kind of gene manipulation. We're talking about gene expression. Here's a picture of the young Zhou Chang. And in this picture, you see that he looks quite different when he's young, right? His genes are, his DNA is the same today as it was back then. It has not changed. And yet, there's a different, there's a change in expression as Joe ages. So now he's a mature man. His genes are behaving somewhat differently to the way that they express themselves when he was younger. So we're talking gene expression here. And to put it another way, to make it simple, as you age, your genetic symphony gets out of tune. If we compare it to an orchestra, when the orchestra is in tune, it sounds beautiful. Everything's harmonious. The bass is at the right level. The violins and the cellos are at the right level. You can just hear the piccolo or the flute. Everything sounds really nice and harmonious. But as we age, the genetic symphony gets out of tune. Perhaps the bass is too loud, or perhaps the, uh, the piccolo is starting to grate on your ears a little bit because it's too loud. Perhaps it's out of tune. So, in age lock, we're talking about retuning your symphony, getting things back to the way that gene expression was when it was youthful. Here's a picture of the cell. And if you look, we know that there are trillions of cells that make up your body. And as you go into the center of each cell, you see that little gray area there. That's the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you see we have all of those chromosomes. The chromosomes, and we'll talk more about them later, are really simply the packing for the DNA. And as you unravel that DNA, you can see that there are long strands. And along those strands, it's divided into sections called genes. So here in this cartoon that I have, there are four genes depicted, different colors. Now genes are simply recipe books. Each gene is a recipe for a gene product, usually a protein. And you can see that there are two genes here. One's producing a little bit of a short protein. The other one's producing a lot of 
a longer protein. Let's call it a structural protein like collagen. Let's look in more detail. Here's gene 1, and in youthful gene expression, it's just producing a little bit of this little protein here. That's normal gene expression for a youthful individual. Gene 2, however, the cookbook is wide open, and it's producing a lot of this longer protein, this structural protein. That's the youthful gene expression pattern. If we look at what happens during aging, the gene has not changed. The DNA remains the same. The cookbook is still there, but now things start to change a little as you age. In aging gene expression, gene 1, instead of just producing a little bit of the, gene, the protein end product, is producing a lot. Gene 2, which normally should be producing a lot, is now producing a lot less. So that's gene expression as opposed to actually the gene itself or the DNA. Now if we were to express this sort of uh, in a scale of green to red, then gene 1 is just in the green there, right? Not producing very much, but as it ages, it shifts over into the red zone. It's producing a lot. If you look at gene 2, it's over in the red zone in the youth. That's where it's supposed to be. But as you age, somehow, for some reason, the cookbook starts to close. Now we're expressing in the green zone. We're going to go back to that green-red uh, type of depiction later. That's called a heat map. So that'll help you to understand the heat map when we read it. So how big is the DNA? How much information is there? This is important to know because I've just talked about two genes and how they might change as we age, but there are a lot more than two genes in the human body. The structure and the size of DNA is mind-boggling, especially when you consider that it's in every single cell of the human body. So here's some DNA here, and let's look at its uh, secondary structure, which is this coil, like a twisted ladder, and then you get into this tertiary structure where it's wrapped around these proteins. And as you look even closer, as you zero in, there's another quaternary folding, or the fourth level of folding of that DNA, because there's so much of it that if you don't look after it in the cell and pack it in a systematic way, it's just going to end up being a bird's nest. I don't know if you've ever taken your kids fishing. I've stopped doing that a long time ago because uh, the fishing line tends to wrap itself up and get knotted very easily. All right, and now you can see where we're headed. This is the chromosome. So all of that packing ends up in the chromosome. We're talking about 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. That means 3 billion bits of information. Now how on earth are we going to sort that out in terms of aging? Well, for the last 20 years or so, and $20 billion worth of research has been done to sequence the human genome. That means to find out <coughs> even how many genes there are, because before this work was commissioned, we didn't even know how many genes were in the human body. We sort of guessed that there might be 100,000 or so. Well, after 20 years, and billions of dollars of research, around 2003, the work was completed and the entire human genome has been sequenced. So now we realize and we've learned that there are somewhere between 25 and 30,000 genes or 30,000 recipes in the human genome. How difficult would that be to, to sort of see or find out which of those genes is changing during the aging process. This is what it would look like, the sequence of the human genome. There are four letters, G, A, T, and C, and each of those letters make a word, and each word is three letters long. So we're talking about a billion words in the human genome. That's about the same as 800 Bibles, each within the chromosomes that are inside the nucleus of a cell which can fit on a pinhead. It's a huge amount of information. And so, Faced with a 3 billion or so of these letters that you see here, what do you think we can make of that? Well, there were high hopes. And in fact, when the human genome was sequenced, uh, President Clinton at one end of the, the globe and uh, the President or the Prime Minister of England at the other end all stood up and said, you know, this is a huge breakthrough. This is taking us one step closer to the meaning of life. And we expect in the next 10 years we're going to have all sorts of science come out of this and we're going to understand the diseases. Well, to put a long story short, I guess, it's been a little bit disappointing. But don't be too hard on the scientists because remember I said there's 3 billion data points there and a billion words. And this is similar to the task that was given to the Egyptologists of the 1700s when they discovered all of these uh, hieroglyphics that were in Egypt all over the tombs and the pyramids, the pillars of the temples. 
Nobody knew what these hieroglyphics meant, but they were tasked with cataloging them all, copying them all down, writing them. And uh, even though we didn't understand what was there, step one was complete. We'd cataloged it. And it wasn't until a very special stone was discovered in 1799 in the Nile Delta by some of Napoleon's uh, army, the Rosetta Stone, that we started now to have a hope that we could translate those hieroglyphics. Because the Rosetta Stone actually contained three languages all saying the same thing, classic Greek and uh, the hieroglyphics and also Coptic. And with that, they dragged the stone off to a, a famous, uh, brilliant linguist in France, Jean-Francois Jean-Paulion, who was able to, uh, un since he already read all of these languages and did from the time that he was about 16 years of age, he was able to then decipher it and now decode the hieroglyphics so that we could understand them. Well, what's exciting about the age lock approach is that unlike ever before, we now have the Rosetta Stone to understanding aging at the genetic level. And we get this through our association with Professor Richard Weindrick, who's a gerontologist who's been studying aging for the last 30 years, and also Thomas Proler, who's a geneticist. And together, the two of them have been able to crack this code and measure aging at the genetic level. And it all begins with the humble little gene chip. Thomas Proler came to Richard Weindrick and said, with your knowledge of aging and the work that you've been doing to look at the sources of aging, and with this technology, the gene chip, which can measure the expression of all 25,000 or 30,000 genes in the human genome, we may be able to understand aging at the genetic level. So this chip is actually able to with a sample from any biological organism, measure the gene expression levels of every single gene. That means we get where they are on that slide. Is it green or is it red for all 25,000 genes? Now imagine if you compare that to different biological states, old and young, and then subtract the differences and find out which genes are changing as you age in their level of expression. Now you have the way to crack the code at the genetic level you can basically have a Rosetta Stone for aging at the genome level. And that's the work that they've been doing for many years. And now, as you are probably well aware, we've acquired LifeGen. So all of their patents, all of their knowledge, the database that they have is now part of NuSkin's intellectual property. That gives us a real edge at targeting the sources of aging, the age lock approach. So here's a heat map. And now you understand it, right? Here we have genes that are young, and you can see the gene expression levels that have changed as you become old. I think I've explained this a little earlier. The goal then is to reactivate or to find out what sort of a strategy, what kind of ingredients can reactivate those old genes so that they're expressing themselves so that they're youthful again. Here's an example. You have now the old and the young pattern screening for ingredients. And you can see here that ingredient 4 has actually reactivated the old gene expression so that it looks much more like that of the younger gene expression pattern. This is something that nobody's ever been able to do before age lock. It's important to know that we have this gene expression data bank. Now, I told you before how immense, how huge this, the, the level of data is in the human genome. So as you do each experiment, you're generating millions of data points. We have been, or LifeGen has been accumulating over the last many years, all of the information that they've gathered from looking at different tissues, different species, and uh, different states of life, young versus old, different ingredients, different nutritional regimens. All of that information has gone into this database. Just to give you an example of the kind of uh, data that's generated, in this simple experiment alone, there are 30,000 genes per genome, as I mentioned. And uh, in this simple experiment, five individuals were in tested with various ingredients. Seven biological conditions, young and old, plus five ingredients. So this adds up to about 10.5 million gene expression data points. So you can see that this quickly starts to accumulate. This is information that we have that helps us to access uh, understanding aging at the genetic level. This is our age lock tool. 
Now I've spent a bit of time explaining this to you because I, help, I need you to understand that AgeLock is not just one sort of one approach or one product. It's a whole approach to looking at aging at the sources and not just the signs and the symptoms. So using this AgeLock tool, now we're able to go and to investigate aging and see what we can do about it. So again, I mentioned before, youthful feeling is very much related to how productive your cells are and how youthful they're expressing themselves. And those cells, in terms of their energy production and how they're able to cleanse themselves, are also very much dependent upon how the genes are expressing themselves. That's targeting the sources of aging. Now, if we want to feel youthful again, then we should start to look at the machinery that provides energy for the cell and for the human body. The mitochondria are the nuclear power plants of the cell, if you will. Those are the little organelles within the cell that are able to combine oxygen and sugar or some sort of uh, energy source into, uh, into energy, into the chemical energy of the body, which is ATP. We know from all of the research that's been done that mitochondrial activity does decline with age. So you see here in this graph, uh, approximately a 40% reduction in efficiency of the mitochondria by the time you're about uh, 60. So, uh, you know, this is not a sudden decline, but it's a gradual decline as you age. So it seems very logical then that we should first examine which genes are responsible for building and maintaining the mitochondria in the body. So let's go to the nucleus and find that out. And using the age lock tool, we could determine which genes are involved in energy production and maintenance. The next thing that happens with aging, and it's closely related as I'll explain later, is that cellular cleansing declines with age. It declines with age as well. That means that we have, as cellular energy goes down, we also have an increase or a toxic buildup of those things that are not healthy for the cell, that the cell needs to get rid of. Putting, looking at it another way, if you see the, the blue cylinder on the left, let's just say that that's a barrel that contains the, uh, the cellular um, purification system. And that's the capacity of the cell to keep itself clean and to renew itself. And then you look to the right and you see that there are toxins that cause the cell to age, damage the proteins and things like that. Some are external toxins like the pollution, the air that we breathe, uh, maybe it's sun exposure, things like that that damage the cell or cause it to age, cause the proteins to age. And then you've got internal toxins as well. These are just the results of our metabolic processes. It's sort of like the metabolic exhaust that we produce, some of it from the mitochondria. And in the youthful cell, then we have more than enough capacity for the cell to cleanse itself and to keep itself renewed. Now as we age, the aging cell is a different story. You see that the capacity of the cell to cleanse itself has reduced quite a lot. And that means that it can't keep up with the toxic burden that's there. That is the picture of an aging cell or an aged cell that we need to change. These are actually very closely related. They seem like separate things and certainly they are separate uh, machinery within the cell and the genes that code for that equipment are also separate but they work together ultimately because as cellular energy declines then the ability of the cell to purify itself also declines. And as that happens, it affects cellular energy because things get sort of gummed up in the cell. So you get this downward spiral. It's a one-two punch of aging. And that affects your ability to feel young. And put it a really simple way, if you don't have any energy, you can't clean, right? It's just like a vacuum cleaner that you can no longer plug into the wall. It becomes a lot harder. And then uh, before you know it, you're tripping over all the junk. So we have targeted those genes that are involved in cellular energy, a youth gene cluster, we'll call it, and cellular purification, a separate youth gene cluster. And you can see that as we age, because we have found those genes that change during the aging process, then we can target those and try to reactivate them. And that's what the age lock tool is all about. Targeting those genes and then reactivating them so that we can have that youthful feeling again. So in summary then, we've got an approach where we target the sources of aging. That's what age lock is. And our association with LifeGen technologies, our database, all of that information that we have on being able to interpret the genome 
at the aging level, or in other words, measure aging at the genetic level, has enabled us to have a whole new innovative approach at targeting the sources of aging and doing something about it. In this case, we've targeted two systems inside the body, cellular energy and cellular purification that I've shared with you are intricate, intricately connected. And the cellular energy helps us to feel recharged, the cellular purification helps us to feel refreshed. Now these work together as I mentioned, right? So cellular energy in a youthful cycle actually is a positive thing for cellular purification. And cellular purification is a positive sort of a feedback for energy production, helping uh, with the recharged and the refreshed feeling of youth. So the science then in a nutshell is identifying and targeting then reactivating the youth gene clusters related to cellular energy production and cellular oxidative protection and cleansing. 